Greetings, everyone. T-Strats here with what I think is an incredibly insightful and fascinating video with an incredible payoff at the end. I truly hope you make it all the way through this video because I think the way that it all wraps up is one of the best, actually probably the best video I've ever made. So I just would like to thank both PlayStation and Naughty Dog for providing me with a free copy of this game. And I would like to thank each of you for spending your time with me here today. Now, please enjoy my interpretation of The Last of Us Part Two. Joel's guitar in The Last of Us Part Two is symbolic of his attempt to reconcile his broken relationship with Ellie and represents Ellie's guilt and anger over having a meaningful, messiah-like death taken from her. The guitar is also her medium for connecting to Joel through music. There is a literal significance behind the moth as well that I will reveal later in this video. Ellie is struggling in her relationship with Joel and her inability to forgive him or anyone else for that matter. This is first evidenced by her refusal to offer any sort of forgiveness to the bigot Seth who offered her what must be a highly coveted post-apocalyptic steak sandwich. This is Ellie's big flaw. She has an inability to forgive. Abby is driven solely by vengeance which consumes her very being. She has spent five years training and building up her physique in order to hunt down Joel. We are first introduced to her waking from a nightmare, indicating something is unresolved in her life. She believes seeking revenge is how to fix it. This is an important point of understanding how Joel's actions at St. Mary's Hospital so strongly affects the journey and transformation of these two women. Abby must find closure with her father's death, whereas Ellie must learn how to forgive Joel for his betrayal. Joel's new life, and really all of Jackson, is built upon a lie. The very first scene of the game is his confession to Tommy and illustrates his desire to repair his broken relationship with Ellie. The problem is he has no idea how to and is looking to Tommy for some guidance or advice. This is evidenced by how he chooses to react to Seth's hateful comments towards Ellie at the dance, and he really only pushes Ellie even further away from him. The reality is, is that Joel has had a false victory as he's living in Jackson with his family under a deceitful pretense. We may view Jackson as a representation of Elysium, the legendary Greek paradise for those who lived a righteous life. We know Joel did not live a righteous life. He does not deserve to be there, and thus why his lie undermines every meaningful relationship in his life. When Joel told Ellie that she could never tell anyone about her immunity, he is essentially asking her to disavow her true self, to not be who she truly is. The moth tattoo on Ellie's forearm covers up her bite mark and is a clear indication of the deceit and secrecy of their relationship. She is literally marked by Joel's original sin, another example of how the moth symbol represents her unresolved guilt and anger for what he's taken from her. Joel's journey must be one of atonement. His inability to come to terms with his daughter's death is the driving force behind his profound guilt and selfishness. He feels guilty for having robbed Ellie of her meaningful death and damned humanity for the rest of their days. We as players want to view Joel as we did for the majority of the first game, but after four years he's begun his path towards atonement. He's attempting to change his ways. Joel, Abby, and Ellie all must embark on a journey to deal with the guilt that stems from the original sin he committed in Salt Lake City. It's fitting that Ellie arrives at the cabin shortly before Joel's death, if for no other reason than to bear witness to his final moments. Joel's demise serves as a warning to both Abby and Ellie, as it's clear he failed to atone for his mistakes and died without reconciling his flaw, selfishness. His attempt to atone was rooted in violence, not compassion and empathy. Joel shows this by how he reacts to Seth at the dance, because he reacts to things violently instead of thinking them through, a flaw he shares with his brother Tommy as well. Another example is how he puts Ellie in mortal danger during their attempt to get new guitar strings, despite knowing someone had disappeared in that area the year before. Lastly, the fact he doesn't even attempt to bargain on behalf of his brother after being shot by Abby is proof he didn't change. His selfishness shows in the end he doesn't care for anyone, including himself. After delivering the final blow, Abby stands motionless while the rest of her group decide Ellie and Tommy's fate. 
when she finally turns around and tosses the club away, she appears guilt-stricken and hollow, as if waiting for a cathartic moment that never arrives. Abby and Ellie are both present to bear witness to Joel's end, and now must embark on their journey of their own to avoid Joel's mistake and reconcile their flaws. For Abby, her flaw is the misconception that vengeance will somehow fix her father's death. And for Ellie, it's learning to forgive Joel and stop the cycle of violence that he began. Revenge is the initial central theme of The Last of Us Part Two, caused directly from Joel's original sin in St. Mary's Hospital. Its cyclical nature is reflected throughout the game from the very start, as Abby wants revenge for her father, and Ellie and the player want revenge for Joel. Along with the cycles of violence, there are cycles of empathy and compassion, essentially forgiveness. In my opinion, Naughty Dog wanted us to experience this cycle well before the characters as we are forced to observe and comprehend the conflicting nature of the intense Abby vs. Ellie encounters. I think it's important to note that Abby and her crew were caught up in the Seattle WLF Seraphite revenge cycle for four years before finding Joel. While it appears that everything falls apart after they return as they begin dying one by one, the truth is that it was already falling apart. At one point, Owen alludes that Abby tortured others for the sadistic Isaac, another sign that they had already lost their way. The physical deterioration of Seattle and the lack of a new community building is deeply rooted in the pointless war between the WLF and Seraphites, and highlighted by the fact that they're not addressing the real issue, the infected that still populate their lands in great numbers. For example, the buildings they use for bases and to fight each other, such as the WLF Hospital and the Seraphite Skybridge, are still riddled with infected because they're focusing so intently on a war which no one really understands. Owen echoes this sentiment during his conversation with Abby on the sailboat, when he says he's tired of fighting for land he doesn't give a fuck about. He also shares that he doesn't believe he can continue killing Seraphites, and offers both points as reasoning to leave it all behind and chase an uncertain lead to Santa Barbara. It's very similar to Joel's presence in Elysium slash Jackson. It was built upon something that needed to change. They were built upon lies, and that's why it needed to change. In Seattle, it started first when the WLF overran and executed the last members of Fedra. Following that, Isaac's bloodlust created the Seraphite martyr, and then the Seraphites took their martyr's words and twisted them to justify their violence. Both the Seraphites and the WLF are using lies to push an agenda. We can see this in the dilapidation of the world around the main characters, as even though we see humans master the elements with greenhouses for food and schools for children in the three main bases, in Jackson, in the stadium, and in Haven, it directly contrasts with the rundown world riddled with infected traps and corpses. The greenhouses and schools specifically illustrate that such growth and prosperity is possible with cooperation, but because of the cycles of violence that continue to persist, the majority of the world is deprived and rotting, much like Ellie's soul. I believe it's important to note how strong the pull is for people getting sucked into vicious cycles of violence and revenge. Joel's original sin forced both Abby and Ellie into such a cycle where had he come to terms with the loss of his own daughter, he may have helped deliver humanity into a new age instead. We see Ellie and Abby have been sucked into a vortex of vengeance and revenge, which is perfectly reflected in the brutal landscape of Seattle. Many central characters take refuge in abandoned buildings designed for art and education, such as the aquarium, symbolizing the harmony of nature even if it's out of control, and the theater that's acting out a real tragedy instead of one purely for entertainment. The entire world is becoming engulfed in this cycle, and in this timeline you only see PlayStation 3s laying around. The PlayStation 4 never came to fruition. That means that no one ever got to play The Last of Us Factions in glorious 60 frames per second because the entire world is being held back by this cycle of violence. I'm joking, yes, but it's still a valid point. Owen's quote about fighting for land he doesn't care about seems to be a very strong reference to the long-lasting cycle of violence that is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, with the highly militarized WLF as Israel and the Seraphites as Palestine, though the latter seems to draw inspiration from the Amish more than anyone else. The presence of the Martyr's Gate is another strong reference to this connection. It's a pointless conflict reflected in the WLF's warmongering first with Fedra, then the Seraphites, and the Broken Truce. Isaac is the name of the WLF leader, but it is also the name of one of the founders of Israel. 
It's important to note that neither side is portrayed as heroes or villains, but simply stuck in an almost monotonous cycle of revenge and hatred that contributes nothing but pain and death as it continues to repeat. Writer and creative director Neil Druckmann was born in the West Bank in Israel and spent his formative years there until moving to the United States at the age of 10 years old. Hebrew is his first language, and I believe that taking a look at the Hebrew entomology of many names and symbols in The Last of Us can reveal additional insight and meaning. For example, the Hebrew word for moth is ash, which means falling away in reference to how clothes can be eaten away by moths. This symbolism is readily apparent in Joel and Ellie's broken relationship as she falls away from him for years at a time and is unable to forgive him. As I previously mentioned in my What's in a Name video, Yara is an Arabic name which means little butterfly and Lev is Hebrew for heart. The butterfly is a universal symbol for transformation. Combined, they are a little transformation of the heart, which perfectly describes what transpires the first time they meet Abby, dangling from a noose and only moments away from death. Despite having fought against the WLFs their entire lives, Yara and Lev begin a cycle of empathy and compassion by saving Abby. This is one of the most important moments in the game, and a catalyst for Abby reconciling her flaw of coming to terms with her father's death. Abigail, by the way, means father's joy in Hebrew. Here we have Ellie and Abby going on both a physical and emotional journey to overcome their flaws. Both are sparked into it by a catalyst. For Ellie, it's Joel's murder, and for Abby, it's her capture by the Seraphites. Joel's murder happened because of his sin, and Abby was captured because she was trying to save Owen, whose worldview had changed after killing Joel, which connects both stories. At the start of the journey, there is foreshadowing and contrast between the books that they read. Ellie prefers science and space and dinosaurs, whereas Abby prefers classic literature of revenge, personal growth, and tragedy. Despite the differing worldviews, there are numerous similarities in each of their headquarters where they reside, as well as the vengeance for their dead fathers and the peculiar way that they commune with them, Ellie with the guitar and Abby with the collecting of coins. Ellie's losing sight of Dina is foreshadowed very early in the game, during the snowstorm outside of Jackson where she disappears right before her eyes. This scene serves as a stark warning to Ellie, and unfortunately it's a warning that she never heeds. As they approach Seattle, Dina and Ellie share the traumatic experiences of their first kill, a conversation that subtly suggests and foreshadows future events. Ellie is not in Seattle for long before she begins slaughtering both wolves and seraphites in her relentless search for Abby and her crew. There's no character development along her journey, only a regression towards a destructive, descending path. As they approach the Channel 13 building in search of Leah, Ellie and Dina strike up a conversation about the reclusive Bill, a lonely man in a lonely place, another aspect that foreshadows Ellie losing the people she loves. When Ellie and Dina enter the Saravina Hotel, they discover a gate code written in blood from a member of Abby's crew who was killed while being interrogated. Ellie shares that Joel and Tommy use people against each other in this manner, foreshadowing her final encounter with Abby. Each member of Abby's crew dies one by one, either by being killed by Tommy, the Seraphites, or Ellie herself. It's important to remember that despite all her efforts, Ellie is never able to locate Abby in Seattle. It is only after Ellie discovers she killed not only Mel, but also her unborn child, that she momentarily snap out of her obsession with revenge and begins to consider what she is actually doing. Murdering the pregnant Mel hits a little too close to home, and she now considers that perhaps family is more important than vengeance and realizes she left a vulnerable, pregnant Dina all by herself in a savage, apocalyptic city to avenge a man she can't really forgive. This realization compels her to immediately head back to the theater. On the marquee of the theater, we see that a play titled Cassandra, an American Tragedy, is set to open on Outbreak Day. Cassandra, a figure of Greek mythology, was bestowed the curse of telling true prophecies which no one believed. Each of the previous foreshadowing examples, losing sight of Dina, the lonely Bill, pitting people against each other, are Cassandra moments Ellie simply ignores. Despite all the warnings, Ellie begins to realize she's on the wrong path after murdering a pregnant mother, which is a symbol of growth, and is trapped in a cycle of vengeance. 
During her confrontation with Abby in the theater, she finally realizes her actions are going to get her entire family killed, so she reveals to Abby that she is the girl from the Firefly Lab, the chosen one, completely misunderstanding Abby's anger. Why is Ellie unable to find Abby along her path of destruction? It is because Abby has taken the first steps towards change and is on a different path, both literally and emotionally. A chance show of mercy, or a little transformation of the heart, from Lev and Yara, the only true innocence despite both wanting to be soldiers, sparks another vision from Abby's father. The reoccurring dream in the hospital shows Abby still hasn't dealt with her father's death, and now this guilt extends to the kids as she feels she owes them for saving her life. She goes with Lev on a mission to collect medical supplies for Yara, who is dying from compartment syndrome, and along that journey discovers a new world. She trained relentlessly for years to build herself to physically extreme levels so she could defeat Joel in her obsession of revenge. As they descend higher and higher towards the sky bridge, Lev senses Abby's discomfort and fear of heights. Lev then tries to calm the frightened Abby by explaining the benefits of her fear. Only when I am weak may I carry my true strength, says Love, quoting the Seraphite scripture. He is explaining to her that true strength only occurs when we face our fears. At the end of the sky bridge, Abby falls through a glass roof and into a pool below. It's a symbolic baptism, with Abby emerging from the water, purified, reborn, and renewed in spirit. A direct result of her helping the innocent Yara and Love, learning about them, and trying to deal with her father. Her journey concludes with her bravely facing and overcoming her inner demon, a symbolic amalgamated monster in the lower level of the WLF hospital, a nearly identical location as the one where her father died. She went through all this in order to save one of her traditional enemies who she's been mindlessly fighting against for years. She has ascended to the heavens during this quest and is now fighting in hell. The fight in the hospital basement shows that Abby has achieved significant emotional growth and is finally dealing with her father. This growth is soon confirmed by her next vision, which shows her father in an idyllic heaven-like setting instead of the horrible red flashing one indicative of hell. Abby has walked an emotional journey where an act of compassion has freed her from her cycle of vengeance and has allowed her to overcome her fears and flaws and begin to purify the world around her. Ellie, however, is just now realizing she is the one responsible for losing everyone she cares about because she never came to terms with Joel, nor her guilt, and fears over what she is and was meant to be. She has been placing everyone she cares about in danger and has just walked away from her murder of an unborn child. Ellie realizes she hasn't escaped the cycle of vengeance and is still following the same path as Joel before her and is descending down towards a similar demise. The consequences of Joel's original sin is not only did he steal her meaningful death from her, but his selfishness intertwined with love made Ellie abandon her true self and set her on a path of misery and destruction that mirrors his. His inability to deal with his daughter's death, combined with his horrific actions at St. Mary's, has infected Ellie's innocence and soul, and left her ill-prepared to figure out how to remedy it. Despite all she's been through, Ellie still hasn't resolved her feelings with Joel, and perhaps you, as the player, haven't either. She doesn't eat nor sleep well, and is suffering horribly from the effects of PTSD. She is eroding away, emotionally and physically, and no longer knows how to function in life. Tommy arrives with an injured eye, which is very notable after having killed Manny of the WLF with a sniper shot through the eye. This is reflective of his eye-for-an-eye eye mentality, as he still seeks vengeance, which has no place in the new world. He's physically crippled, emotionally crippled, and has lost his family, as Maria has left him. Only this time, it's not because of Abby's actions, but purely his own. Dina, like so many others, has resolved the fact that she's lost loved ones, such as her child's father, Jesse. She's moved on and is ready to settle down in her own little safe piece of heaven, as the golden fields outside her house are representative of the golden Elysian fields, as they are in Jackson. 
Ellie has reached a sort of stasis as she apparently has everything she could ever hope for at the farm with Dina and JJ, but failure to change will result in her metaphorical or literal death. Her PTSD issues are basically related to Joel. Ellie is reliving his issues and she has to figure out a way to remove his infection of her soul. This is contrasted by Abby's baptismal cleaning of her soul through ascendant path upon the sky bridge. In order for Ellie to complete her journey, she must deal with Joel. After all she's been through, there's been no payoff for Ellie, nor the player. The journey is all about change, and there is no change here on the farm, so she must once again go out on one more final mission. Ellie arrives on the shores of yet another hell, a different land but with the same atrocities. Here, there doesn't appear to be a war per se, but rather a slaving colony. Ellie is still on her path to vengeance, following the same modus operandi as her journey to Seattle. When caught in a trap by a local faction called the Rattlers, Ellie uses her immunity in a selfish manner to escape. A short while later, she inadvertently frees slaves and questions them for Abby's whereabouts, another action made for selfish reasons. Ellie has always struggled with having her meaningful death taken from her. She wanted her immunity to mean something, to have the purpose of saving others. In these two actions, she finally takes advantage of her immunity and saves people, but all for selfish reasons, to complete her own vengeance against Abby. She has learned nothing. She now heads down a long, ominous corridor, just as Joel did in St. Mary's Hospital, moments before committing his original sin. I must add that this final chapter of The Last of Us Part Two is probably one of the most brilliant and misunderstood experiences I've ever come across in video games. Ellie's walk out of the corridor is epically symbolic of the biblical event known as the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, which happened to Jesus in the New Testament. After the Last Supper, Jesus went for a walk to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. During this walk, he became overcome with sadness and his sweat became great drops of blood falling upon the ground. It was here that Jesus accepted his fate of betrayal in the moments before his arrest and eventual crucifixion. Over the course of the level, we see numerous tables and place settings, indicating the Last Supper, and Ellie walks in agony, seeping blood from her wound. The symbolism is about acceptance. The walk down to the beach is an incredibly powerful and moving experience. In The Last of Us, Ellie played the role of a Jesus-like Messiah, as she could choose to die to save us all. As we approach the pillars, I can't help but feel overwhelmed by the stunning imagery which strongly evokes a biblical crucifixion. Upon the pillars we find love, and a barely recognizable Abby, a shell of her former muscular self, tied up in a Christ-like pose practically a mockery of the meaningful death Ellie always dreamed of. Abby had made herself physically strong so that she could exact her vengeance upon Joel. Now, she is no longer physically stronger, a subtle indication that she has left her hate for Joel behind. Abby has attained significant emotional and spiritual growth, but is now physically her weakest, which echoes the Seraphite prophecies by showing her true strength by forgiving Ellie for murdering her friends and showing only a desire to protect love and procure their passage to the new world, where the fireflies may reside. We observe that Abby has been severely punished, not for her murder of Joel, but for trying to finish her journey and for fighting against the hate of the world, represented here by the Rattlers. At this moment, both Ellie and the player pities her, and Ellie finally commits her first act of mercy and frees Abby from the pillar. Abby frees Lev and carries him to the boat in the very same parental manner that Joel carried Ellie out of the hospital in Salt Lake. At this point, we ask ourselves, has Ellie finally come to terms with not being a Masonic figure? Has she completed her emotional journey? Has she freed herself from all the lessons Joel taught her, such as, to be strong, you must be vicious? As she moves towards the boat, her blood triggers her PTSD, which represents her relationship with Joel. The feeling she is overcome with can easily be described with a single word, guilt. That is what her vengeance has been about, resolving her guilt. 
Her selfish feelings kick in, and much like Joel and Tommy's technique of pitting people against each other, she forces Abby to fight by putting her knife to Lev's throat. As the brutal encounter reaches its conclusion, Ellie pushes Abby beneath the water and begins to drown her. As we think back, we might remember that Ellie's very first kill was against a man attempting to drown Joel in this very same manner, a kind of corrupted baptism, immersing herself in Joel's worldview and the start of her spiritual downfall. When it seems Ellie is on the cusp of drowning Abby, she has a sudden flashback to Joel on his porch with the guitar. This is Ellie's moment of maybe not forgiving Joel, but letting him go. She has finally moved on and let him go. There is a cost for learning this lesson. Just as Tommy lost his sight, Ellie loses part of herself physically, two of her fingers. The final image of the game is the same as the opening image of the game, the moth on Joel's guitar. Only this time we see Ellie has left the guitar against the windowsill and is embarking on a journey to an uncertain fate. Joel uses the guitar in an attempt to repair his complex relationship with Ellie, and we can see that by leaving the guitar, Ellie has finally moved on from Joel. It's up to the player to decide if Ellie forgave Joel or simply came to accepting what he had done. This also alludes to the next step in Ellie's journey. She must now renew herself and grow as Abby did if she's to reach a promised land. At the beginning of the game, all the main characters' relationships were defined by how they felt about Joel. And now we can see that the main characters have all literally and figuratively moved on from him. The final scene invites a quiet contemplation, and it is here that I disclose the biggest and most important revelation of this entire experience. There is a third main character who is intrinsically tied to the narrative of this game. You. You are the third main character. The journey for the player and for Ellie is to reconcile with Joel's death and to forgive Abby. If we fail to forgive Abby, we get stuck in a cycle of hate. The initial reactions to Joel's death show this is unfortunately the case for some of us. You, the player, have embarked on this emotional journey, and if you're able to support your growth and complete the journey within you, there's hope for the world. But should you find yourself complaining that there's no payoff, especially along the lines of killing Abby, then you are like Ellie. In the end, it all comes down to this. If we can't forgive Abby, a fictional character, how in the hell are we going to heal the world? The Last of Us Part Two uses real-world analogies because it's trying to explore and illuminate the issues within us that need to be addressed, the flaw in ourself and the world. This game is a catalyst for our own spiritual journey. Thank you for sharing your time with me today. I wish you well. Cheers.